Good evening, my name is Katarzyna Nowicka and this is Poland Daily News. Memory and caution is the motto of today's celebrations of the 80th anniversary of the outbreak of World War II. After three speeches in the Piłsudski Square in Warsaw, a national cannon salute and symbolic strike of the memory and caution bell were made. Guests from all over the world took part in the ceremonies. Memory and caution. These words were the main message of the ceremony here at Piłsudski Square on the 80th anniversary of the outbreak of World War II. At the beginning, President Andrzej Duda thanked the guests who came here. Some of them came here from the other side of the globe to show our togetherness in remembering the Second World War. That war had a special dimension which left a mark in many places, one that still remains in many souls, one that can also be seen in many places, with broken architecture, beauty that the cities lost when they were destroyed during the war, cities which could not be rebuilt in the same style due to lack of resources. The nation to which I belong is such a nation. It was here that the Second World War began on September 1st, 1939. Important words were also said during the speech of the President of Germany. He began his speech by saying that there is no other place in Europe where it is so difficult for him to speak in his native German. He asked for forgiveness and spoke of Germany's full responsibility for the Second World War, although there was no mention of economic responsibility. A war ends when the weapons are silenced but its effects are an inheritance for the following generations, and this inheritance is a painful one. We, Germans, accept it and carry it with us. As German president and together with the German chancellor, we want to tell all Polish people that we will never forget. We will not forget the wounds inflicted by Germans on Polish people. We will not forget the suffering of the Polish families, nor their courage and resistance. We will never forget. The United States Vice President Mike Pence spoke on behalf of President Donald Trump. He spoke a lot about the Polish spirit, Polish courage and the fact that Poland proved to be the homeland of heroes. If I were called upon to identify briefly the principal trait of the entire century, I would be unable to find anything more precise bardziej precyzyjnego niż to. Men have forgotten God. Człowiek zapomniał Boga. Those who sought to remake the world Ci, by force did not have the last word. Przeobrazić świat siłą because nie there was mieli jednak ostatniego słowa, ponieważ coś większego stanęło im naprzeciw. Przez brutalność wojny and through four decades i przez 40 lat Rządów komunistycznych, jak powiedział dwa lata temu w Warszawie prezydent Trump, Polska i inne narody ujarzmione Europy przetrwały brutalną kampanię zniszczenia ich wolności, praw, historii i wiary, ale nigdy nie straciliście ducha. Najeźdźcy starali się was załamać, ale Polska nie może być złamana. All the leaders present at the ceremony laid a joint wreath at the grave of the unknown soldier. Each of them also struck the symbolic bell, which was cast especially for the occasion on which the slogan Memory and Caution was engraved. Now it will be handed over to the city of Jelun, which was one of the first places to be bombed on September 1, 1939. Poland was one of the countries which suffered the most losses during the Second World War. The Polish nation also never surrendered to tyranny, neither German nor Russian. Magdalena Bałkowiec was with the participants of the 80th anniversary of the outbreak of the Second World War at the Piłsudski Square in Warsaw. Here, at the Piłsudski Square in Warsaw, where the ceremonies for the 80th anniversary of the outbreak of the Second World War were taking place, we couldn't forget about the most important guests, the veterans. They shared some of their often painful memories with me and told me what effect the Second World War had on them and their families. 
I lost my entire family. After the war, I was sick. I had pulmonary and bone tuberculosis. I came to Krakow and the doctors told me I had no chance of surviving, since they didn't have any special medicine. But I somehow survived. I wear the striped outfit to educate people, especially those who say that there was no Holocaust. I know that there was one. I only blame the Germans. They started the war. They are responsible for it. And it's them who should pay for it. I was 10 years old. I remember it all. I survived being sent deep into the USSR. I spent five years in Siberia. Thank God I managed to come back and I'm alive to this day. Many Poles from all over the country came to the Piłsudski Square to show that the memory of the victims of the German aggression and the heroes who stood against it is still alive. World War II began with a German genocidal raid on the Polish border town of Wieluń. The massacre of defenseless civilians carried out by the Luftwaffe pilots turned out to be the prelude to the nightmare that fell on Poland and later throughout the world. At the hour of the German air raid 80 years ago, the Polish and German presidents Andrzej Duda and Frank Walter Steinmeier paid tribute to the victims. The Second World War began with a war crime, said the Polish president. At the same time, Andrzej Duda pointed to the fact that the German bombings were conducted in violation of international law and foretold the coming of total war. President Duda also mentioned the presence of the German president, stressing that his presence in Wieluń is a testimony of truth, as well as a form of moral compensation. Who would have guessed that the Second World War would begin with such a horrible attack conducted by a civilized nation, one of the oldest nations in Europe? It was a normal world which was destroyed and ruined against any human standards and was worth stressing in violation of the international law, in violation of the Hague Conventions. It was nothing but a war crime. The Second World War began with a war crime. In turn, the president of Germany, Frank Walter Steinmeier, asked for forgiveness in Germany's name for causing the Second World War. I bow to the victims of the attack on Wieluń. I bow before Polish victims of German tyranny and I ask for forgiveness, said President Steinmeier in German and Polish. The German head of state stressed that it was in Wieluń where all hell broke loose, caused by the German hatred and desire for race dominance. According to Steinmeier, the bombing of Wieluń was a terrorist act. He mentioned that many Germans still are uneducated about this matter. The German president also pointed to the fact that it was in Wieluń where the Polish-German neighborly relations ended. Those who know these pictures, who heard the story about this tragedy, death and destruction, which was caused by the German attack 80 years ago, know that it was here that the German hatred, violence and crime were born. For six years they ravaged Poland and the entirety of Europe. I bow to the victims of the attack on Wieluń. I bow before Polish victims of German tyranny and I ask for forgiveness. The barbaric bombing of Wieluń began on September 1, 1939 at 4.40 a.m. 29 diving bombers Junkers 87 took part in the attack. Due to the German bombs, most of the city's buildings, including hospital and historical monuments, were ruined. There are discrepancies in the number of victims. However, according to many historians, on that day even 2,000 people may have lost their lives in the small town. They were the first victims of the Second World War. Prime Minister Mateusz Morawiecki attended the Westerplatte festivities in the early morning. It was there that the Schleswig-Holstein cruiser fired the first cannon salvos on the Polish military depot during World War II. It is said that the night is darkest just before dawn. The attack on Poland by Hitler's Germany happened suddenly. This meant the darkest days for us in history. Churchill said that German crime had no name. Rafał Lemkin gave this crime a name of his own. It was a giant crime of genocide. Genocide on the Polish nation, on Polish citizens. Every day, for six years. Every day, 3,000 people were killed and died on various fronts in different circumstances. In death camps, on the streets of Warsaw, in pacified villages. Daily. 
The first victim of war is said to be the truth. The first victim of the war, besides the truth, was freedom, human dignity, and Poland guarded those values, those fundamental values for Western civilization, for European civilization. That's all for tonight. Now on to Poland Daily Business with Aleksander Wierzejski and his guest. Thank you. Welcome to Poland Daily Weather. Let's see the forecast for tonight. Warm night ahead of us, temperature will hover between 17 degrees. The highest temperature we will see in Kraków and Katowice at 20 degrees. In large parts of the country, sky will be clear. Thunderstorm will appear over Kraków. What will the weather look like tomorrow? In Poznań and in Rzeszów, we are expecting a downpour and storm. In the rest of the country, loads of sunlight are expected. The temperature will range from 26 to 31 degrees on the south. The pressure will little rise. Let's check the weather for the next days. On Tuesday, light showers will appear on the northeast. On Wednesday, rainfall will leave our country. Temperature will fall and will hover about 21-23 degrees. On Thursday, temperature will increase again to 33 degrees. Stormy weather over Rzeszów. Thank you for watching and goodbye. Welcome to our Poland Daily Business Show. This time, Pamela uh, Gmiter from Staffer. Hi, thank you. Uh, well, it's our pleasure. You are in very peculiar business, hiring people to fill the position in hotel. Do you think uh, is your business threatened by uh, artificial intelligence? I mean, that, which will replace first your uh, workers and finally yourself. Um, I don't think it's a threat in my business uh, because I'm a, a, in the lack of workers, right? So uh, if I had technology that could help me with it, uh, it would be good. Uh, at, at this point, um, how AI is actually helping me uh, is we've created this application where our workers and our clients have access to it. Our workers see their shifts and based on their location where they live, based on their preferences of hours, based on uh, uh, you know uh, where they click that they like to go to work, the system creates events for them saying here there's good work for you there's work for you that's close to your house uh, etc which uh, helps me as in more in the office of management these staff so I have all of their uh, information in the system they, they're doing the scheduling themselves so they're actually happy because they're it's flexible I'm not saying okay you have to work from Monday to Saturday at these hours no this is the uh, events that we have you can sign up yourself and the events created uh, they uh, create this AI intelligence where they're like, oh, this worker really likes going here and here and here. If a new event opens, they get a text message saying, hey, look, uh, maybe you like to go to work here. So in, in that matter, it's helping me. In the matter of uh, creating robo robots that are going to take away waiters, uh, I don't, I'm not too scared about that yet because the human interaction in restaurants and in hotels is uh, still uh, uh, big and, and in need. Um, I'm hoping uh, for the waiters that they might get robots that will help them serve the client, like carrying the plates, carrying the, the, the trays. But I think the human interaction between the waiter and the guest, uh, it's going to take a long time to take that away. Um, some hotels are using these applications that let you choose food and speaks in your language, whatever the language mm -hmm. is. Um, There's also sort of a little bit dehumanizing the contacts. Yes. Um, um, you can imagine, like, in the hospitality business, uh, people coming here, so they are expecting to, to meet the locals and have a little bit taste of what is going on. Uh, speaking about your application, how mm -hmm. long it took to develop this 
kind of oh, software? We're, we're constantly developing it. We just, a week ago, we did another update on it, which took a year to create. But the system, we started working on it because at first we worked on it for staffer, uh, creating help for us to schedule people. We started about six years ago. Uh, it took about four years uh, for the system to um, work the way we wanted because obviously every month we're like, oh, this would be nice. This would be nice if it, the system did that for me. So we tried to make the system human-like where, okay, this is going to help, this is going to help make it happen. Uh, and then about two years ago, we actually converted the system into a SaaS model and we created Synchroner, uh, which sells the system now. So other agencies can use the system uh, and buy into it. Uh, companies that don't want to use staffing agencies can get the system and and they can create their own little agency within in-house. So um, as far as that, I think that's great because uh, as we were speaking, uh, you know, the lack of workers, we need to uh, get help to, to get the work done. Who got the idea that you will not go to the market and find a system that already works, but rather develop it in-house? Uh, well, nine years ago, when I was hired by the founder of Staffer, uh, he actually convinced me to work for him by telling me his idea. And his idea was, nine years ago, um, I think workers should decide themselves where they want to go. They have a system, they see and they click and they sign up for the shifts. That will uh, give us the chance to use our margin to pay the workers more and give the client a better price because we need less managers to, 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 to do all this. So that's where the idea came from nine years ago. There was nothing even close to an application like this. Uh, till this day, I mean, there is applications that came out, uh, scheduling applications or invoicing applications uh, or recruitment applications, but they're all separate. We've created some Thing that is all in one and uh, and, and um, there is no real uh, still competition with it like I said there is obviously competition outside of Poland we have these uh, systems in England I saw we have them in uh, America um, task rabbit is a little close but not completely uh, task rabbit is in, in America it's something where you uh, can uh, hire an electrician straight without any margin in between so you go on online and you say I need an electrician and electricians around your area can sign up for it. It's kind of the same idea, just uh, the middleman is missing, which we are. Which we are, yes. Well, but uh, it looks like a great idea and looks like uh, something that brings benefit to both, which is uh, the goal that we are pursuing. Yes. Okay, thank you very much, thank Pamela Gmitter of Staffer and uh, Artificial Intelligence may not be that bad as we are all afraid. That was um, Poland Daily Business Edition for tonight. See us next time. Today my guest is an unquestionable star of the Polish music scene. Everyone knows songs like Jolka and Balszewski Święty. Please welcome Krzysztof Tugowski, who still sings and doesn't want to stop. Good evening and thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Thank you for inviting me. Of course I still sing, but not everyone is happy about it. Your youngest son, Krzysztof, also appears on the album. Does he want to follow in his father's footsteps? Maybe not entirely, yes. But it really turns out that you want to convince your child to do something else. Because I thought three people working in music was enough, but it didn't work. The younger son is going more towards acting. He de facto graduated from an English high school recently, and in September he's going to a theatre music university in England. We'll see what will come out of it. Until now, we've only stayed on the topic of music, but you also had a short run with politics. Do you think that a musician has the same right as a lawyer to be a member of parliament? Of course I do. I see no reason for musicians not to be politicians. Uh, we now have two musicians in the parliament. <laughs> sure, I often follow Paweł Kuki's activities with sympathy and I wish him all the best. Previously I thought he'd fare worse, but it turned out it actually works. 
so I congratulate him and I root for him. It turns out his movement has a lot of reasonable, bright ideas. You, however, ended your political career after two years. Why? Already then, I was 55 years old. I was a man fulfilled in career and family. I thought it was a time to do something more. I won't say the phrase a lot of people use, for Poland, for the country and such. It's thrown around too loosely, although it's a great phrase on its own. But I'm not going to say it. I wanted to do something for the city of Lublin, for people close to me, and that's all it was. Honestly, I don't regret it. I now know much more about politics and how you do politics than an ordinary citizen. I don't pretend like I'm not interested in it anymore. I am a careful observer of our political scene. I simply think it's not for me, for several reasons. Firstly, it's bound for teamwork. I'm always joking that I've done some duets in my life, but I prefer to perform solo. That's how I imagine it to be, though it turned out is that it's not possible in politics, regardless of what party you're in. All political parties work in a very similar way, it's just how it is. Of course, I have no resentment, and it was my choice not to run for MP. I think it was the right call. <laughs> I have a different question then. How is your popularity today? You mentioned earlier that the citizens of Lublin have actually gotten used to you. It's normal, you know. I've been walking around the city for 65 years now. <laughs> With uh, breaks? <laughs> but still, and the people got used to it. Really, it's only natural. I'm not excited by the so-called popularity. There are artists who say that being famous can weigh too much, that they are unhappy. They must be lying. Popularity is quite nice, but the best one was during the communist era. It was great. You could get things you wouldn't get any other way in a meat store. <laughs> Unfortunately, you wouldn't get that today, unless they would let you in front of the queue. <laughs> It's gone, yes, but do you know what's the saddest thing for me as an older man, when the young lady is bow to me first? It's not cool because you can see my age. It's a good thing I'm not using public transport because they would move over to give me a place to sit and I think I wouldn't survive that. That's why I avoid public transport. As we established, you're still giving concerts. There will be a moment when you say that you will stop and leave for the well-deserved retirement? No, tak, wie pani, stop na pewno to zrobi mi biologia, bo to nic na to, nic na to nie poradzimy. Mam cichą nadzieję, że to... Surely, yes. Biology will make that stop for me, and there's nothing I can do about it. I suddenly hope it will be as late as it can be, but it's not something anyone can avoid. Well-deserved retirement. I wouldn't continue on that subject. I need to save money for it all the time, so when I'm not able to work anymore, I'd have enough to survive. So I'll work for at least a few more years and then relax. I won't pretend I don't know how it's going to be, when the phones will stop calling and I won't be preparing for a concert. I have no clue. It will probably be a very difficult moment psychologically for me. When you've been doing something for 40 years, it's certainly harsh to just suddenly stop. I'm counting on God allowing me to tour and sing and make some people laugh and take away some other people's laughter for as long as it takes. Przyprawiać o uśmiech, a niektórych o 
<laughs> and what are your plans for the nearest future? You feel fulfilled. Do you have any other dreams? My only perspective is to walk around the earth for a few more years with this health, and it's not that easy. More and more of my friends pass away or become seriously ill. In my case, it's my everyday life. I can't do anything about it. People say that when they were young, they went to parties and weddings and so on. I attend mainly funerals. But you can't do anything about it. That's how life is. We mustn't end our conversation on such a sad thought, though. Could you tell us something more positive? No. Fine. Let me say that in some time I will be attending a christening and a wedding. So it's not all that bad. Maybe Krzysztof Jr. will surprise you with something. <laughs> Give him some time. He's only 19 years old. You should wait a bit more. But I am counting on him in the future. His older brother others haven't said the last words either. <laughs> Thank you very much for being our guest. Thank you for being with us. Good night. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Poland Daily History. Today we are discussing the events of World War II and the consequences for the Polish nation. We are in the Ochota district of Warsaw, right in front of the monument dedicated to the soldiers who held up the Germans for 19 days on September 1939. The historian Dr. Krzysztof Jabłonka will guide us through this turbulent time in Polish history. Today we're going to discuss about World War II and where is a better place to start than the beginning of everything in 1939, where Germany attacked Poland and kickstart the war? So, can you tell me a little bit about the Polish and German relationships before the war? Relations with Germany generally hadn't been that good prior to the war, although there were two exceptions in the interwar period, so since the regaining of independence on November 11, 1918, up to 1938 and the Munich Agreement. The relations between the two states were quite good right after Poland became free, as Germany thought their eastern neighbors would at least in some ways be part of the so-called Mittel Europe, so it would be under German influence, especially economically. That is why the relations were a bit better in the beginning, and that is why the German ambassador sent to Warsaw was Harry Kessler, who personally knew Marshal Piłsudski, as they both respected each other. Polacy to zerwali, słusznie zresztą, i poprosili bardzo życzliwego Polsce Harry Gesslera o opuszczenie Warszawy. However, Poles broke those good relations, and they were right to do so. They asked the friendly Kessler to leave Warsaw, as they wanted the first countries to acknowledge Poland's freedom to be the states of the victorious Entente. What's more, the Greater Poland Uprising broke out, which was a German-Polish war, already after the First World War, so it would be difficult to remain on good terms with the Germans. The relations between the two countries were improved following the signing of the Versailles Treaty, in which Germany was obliged to consider Poland as a free state and to prepare special diplomatic documents confirming this. Almost immediately, there was a boycott of borders proposed in the treaty. As much as Germany couldn't really boycott its western borders due to the occupation of Rhineland and Ruhr, in the east they could be much bolder. All the Silesian uprising and the fact that one-third of Silesia with most of the factories and mines was given to Poland only brewed up the conflict even more. 
the Weimar Republic behaved horribly to Poland. For instance, it started a customs war, so they put up huge embargoes on anything Poland wanted to export to Germany. They also embargoed coal, even though they needed it very much. And despite the fact the fastest route to import coal was from Polish Silesia. Such actions would mean an economical catastrophe for Poland, but the moment the Germans introduced the embargoes, there was a big strike of miners in Scotland and England. Górników, Szkocji, Anglii. No i Anglia zamówiła w Polsce ogromne ilości węgla, no i cały węgiel zamiast do Rzeszy poszedł both countries ordered huge amounts of coal from Poland for huge amounts of money, and the economy thrived again. The ports in Gdańsk and Gdynia thrived especially. It was at that time that a main railway line was constructed between Silesia and the Polish coast. Gdynia became one of the biggest Baltic ports. This line was also one of the few ones in Europe which was electrified, so it was not only very fast, but also cheap. It was a hit for the Germans, who were prepared to lose much, just so Poland would lose even more. Wywołać w Polsce jak największy kryzys. I to się nie udało. Od tej pory Niemcy wpadły w kryzys i wtedy już Polska nie za bardzo chciała z Niemcami handlować. It didn't work, and instead of Poland going into crisis, it was Germany which did. They all switched, as it was our country which didn't want to trade with our Western neighbors. The economic relations were what mattered the most in the first years following the Versailles Treaty for the two nations. The first warning sign for Poland was the Rapallo Treaty, which was signed during an economic conference when for the first time the diplomatic representatives of the victorious states of Entente met with the officials of the countries which lost. Zwycięskich państw Entente powojemy spotkali się z pokonanymi państwami czyli z Rzeszą i Związkiem Sowieckim. Germany and newly restructured Soviet Union. The conference was taking place in Genoa, but the representatives of Germany and Russia left for a small town of Rapallo, where they signed their own agreement. Firstly, they renounced all financial and territorial claims from after the Great War. Secondly, they formed an alliance-like relations. And thirdly, which was a secret protocol, they agreed to military cooperation. Przywilejowały się nawzajem te państwa w największej formie, a po trzecie, co już było tajnym protokołem, wpuszczono do państwa sowieckiego wszystkie te działania, którym traktat wersalski all the actions that Germany was forbidden to take, it took in Russia. For instance, pilots, marines and other types of soldiers trained in Russia. Some German officers even joined the Russian army, like Bronisław Kaminski, who at the beginning of the Second World War joined the military of the Third Reich. This deeply concerned Poland, as any improvements in the relations of Germany and Russia meant trouble for the country in between for centuries. There was also a second time the relations bettered. It was in 1934 when Hitler unexpectedly signed a non-aggression pact with Poland and renounced any military plans towards the country. Kiedy nieoczekiwanie Hitler zawarł z Polską pakt o nieagresji i wyrzekł się wszelkiego działania militarnego it freed Poland in the sense that it could now conduct a strategy of treating Russia equally to Germany. So the moment Poland struck a deal with Germany, it could do the same with its eastern neighbors. It all worked out in 1938, when Germany suddenly came out with demands towards Poland. Jak z Niemcami. I to się udało do 1938 roku, kiedy to Niemcy nagle wystąpiły z żądaniami dla Pol w stosunku do Polski. So you're telling me that the Poles and the Germans signed a non-aggression pact in 1934, but from what I understood, the uh, Poles did contact the French beforehand to try to figure out what they would do about Hitler, and I was wondering if you can tell me a little bit about that. Oczywiście strona polska zda świetnie sobie zdawała sprawę, ku czemu dąży Hitler i jego partia. The Polish side knew all too well what Hitler and his party were aiming for. We had experts in politics, military and economy who knew German and read not only the Nazi press, but also the infamous book by Hitler, Mein Kampf. W momencie, kiedy już się zanosiło na zwycięstwo partii nazistowskiej w Niemczech, Polacy rozpoczęli 
właściwie równolegle rozmowy. When there were signs that the NSDAP would win the elections, Poland already sent representatives to Germany for talks. Secret Polish officials came to Hitler's party headquarters, probing if they were interested in changing the relations between the Weimar Republic and Poland from bad to good. At the same time, Polish military officials went to France to ask the French military if they would join them in the so-called prevention war on Germany if Hitler was to get into power. W przypadku dojścia Hitlera dokonać tak zwanej wojny prewencyjnej, czyli zapobiegawczej. Knowing what Hitler's program was, Poland wanted to attack Germany with France from two sides. The French, occupying Rhineland, would take West Germany and Poles their eastern side. And that's where the issue of Odra and Nysa rivers came up for the first time, which would later become the border of Poland after the Second World War. It's there where Poland was to begin its conquest of Germany, along with Szczecin, although many Poles were already living there. Po II wojnie światowej. Do tego miejsca wojska polskie, łącznie ze Szczecinem, miały zająć i okupować ziemię. Unfortunately, France was looking up to Great Britain too much, and Great Britain was hesitant to answer. Piłsudski quickly realized that talking to the French was to no avail, so he intensified talks with Hitler's party. It led to the signing of the non-aggression pact, where both sides swore, let me emphasize here, to never ever use violence against each other. The matter of Polishness of Gdańsk was also clear then. Suwerenność nad Gdańskiem nie była od tej pory kwestionowana. As we have seen today, the Second World War had devastating consequences for Poland. Despite the country's best effort to fend off the German aggressors, Poland was occupied first by the Germans and then the Soviet Union until 1989. That's it for today. I'm your host, Benjamin Lee. And I'll see you next time on Poland Daily History. and welcome back to another exciting edition of Poland Daily Travel in the studio with my guest, Nicholas Richardson, who does the best Prince Charles impression. Well, it's even better than Prince Charles. I would say. It, 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 even he's confused, I guess. Yeah, I think, I think uh, you do it uh, thank better. Thank you so much, yes. And let's face it, you, you know, you got yes. the ears for it. Thank you so much. Yeah, and I think yeah, we should acknowledge that. We should. Um, no, if you got it, flaunt it. Right? Exactly right. That's what you got to do. And I probably life. actually like him. One of the few people you'll see in Warsaw wearing double-breasted suits as well. Yeah, nobody wears those anymore. Well, I do. Prince Charles. I used to have one, yeah. you know, one or two of those. I've sort of, I've sort yeah. of decided that I've made my. You know, like Steve Jobs always wore black to make his life interesting, to make it simple. No, yeah. to make it simple, not yeah, interesting. Yeah, I mean, so, so yeah. I've decided. I, during the day, I'll be Prince Charles. At night, I'll be James Bond. This will make simplify my life. You'll be like James Bond. <laughs> yes, exactly. I think so. That, that yeah. seems to work for me. You got a sort of yeah. Bond-like. When I, especially when I'm wearing my dinner jacket, <laughs> then I really am very... Bond-like aura. A Bond-like aura. Other people have said that. You're have not, they? You're not the first to say that. Actually. Really? Yeah. I'm, that, I'm surprised. Yeah. No, I mean, I'm not surprised. No, That's no. what I'm supposed to say. You know, it's very funny. I was, on, I was on, a, on somebody's chat show, and he yeah. introduced me as a poems equivalent to, to James Bond. He Being did? So, yeah, he did. And the funny thing was, on Great his Facebook Scott. page, he then got a, an angry... An angry letter from Sean Connery. No, no, not from Sean. <laughs> from, no. from a Polish chap who said, "No, in from my Sean view, Connery? there's only one Polish James Bond." And and, he, and who was like, that? I don't know. He produced some historical figure who'd been a real spy. So it was just really what? Some people just don't have a sense of humor. Well, that was that was supposed to be funny. It was supposed to be funny. That yeah. that was the whole point. Hey, anyway. you just said three places where you'd like to go in the last episode. Yes. Well, it's your turn now. It's my turn. Yeah. But I, my mind's a blank. Well. I can't think of one place. I'm kidding. Okay, I can't think of a place. You're, you're, my mind is a blank, but I can still think of a place. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> my mind is a blank, and I won't tell you what the word is that, <laughs> that blank is covering up. Okay. Okay. Uh, any it's clues? been bleeped out, that word. <laughs> yeah. The mystery voice for the viewers at home. Maybe. Yeah. I have one question. Uh, yes. on the, in, the, in the beginning of this show, there's a lot of people rushing very fast through the train station. Yes. Do you know how they go? They just stop. I think it's where do you think the they were going? Because they look in a real hurry. It's railway station. It's a oh, it's what? It's a railway station. Not what? 
Railroad. A railway. Station. A railway station. No, no, Johnny Cash sings about a railroad. Yes, but he was American. Not a railway. We have railroads in America. Everywhere else we have railways. I think Johnny Cash knew what to call it. Well, he knew what to call the ones the he The man uses. in black. The man in black, yes. Yeah. But I don't... I, okay. What you're trying to is, is illustrate again... Is the difference between English and American. And American speaking. Yeah. Although yeah. I've noticed that um, train Talking. station is creeping into English now as well. It's train station is creeping in? Into English. Oh, you hear it on Lord. the... I know, it, it, it's very distressing. That's Hollywood again. It is, it is Hollywood. With I think it's Hollywood and the Internet. With their strange ideas and the Internet. Yeah. Good I Lord, know. what can you do? You can't fight the Internet. It's like fighting City Hall. It is. Well, unless you're, you course, unless you're the Chinese can fight the Internet quite successfully, but hey, if you're not the Chinese... I want to say one word to you. Okay. Okay, can I say one word to you? Because we have to move on and talk about okay. travel. That's yes, why well, we're you keep distracting us. Can I say, can I say one word to you? Yes. Shemisel. Shemisel. I've been to Shemisel. Can you say it? She I don't, oh, I don't, I, try to say it. Shemisel. Can you say it? Shechen? Shechen. Not bad. Not bad. But Can you say it? Mienzes Droya. Mienzes Droya. Pretty good. Thank you. I'm surprised. I'm shocked. Yeah. I would have thought I that mean, you'd Shemishal, have trouble with I'm, one I'm actually this. a bit more. Although I've been I had like, to practice for like half yeah, an hour. I've never got... Uh, Shemisel, everybody I ask who's Polish pronounce it slightly differently. And that's all they, they do. They pronounce they, it. Even the, Poles pronounce it yeah, differently. Yeah, I've been a bit confused How could you tell? That. I couldn't tell the difference, really. Well, no, but, but, but they do slightly. Because I keep yeah. asking, because I was when okay. I was there making a program about it, mm -hmm. uh, a history program about it, um, I kept What was the program that you were making? We were making a program about the history of Shemishel, actually. And so... What Which was, is quite interesting. What was like, the focus? It used to be an Austrian town? It used to be an Austrian. Well, Austrian it, it, architecture? It, 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 yes. And the Austrian in, in, in partition. The in the 19th century. Yeah. yeah. Um, it saw a lot of action in the Second World War. Part First of World War II. And the, particularly the First World War as well, where yeah. the, the, the outer and the inner fortifications were built. Yeah, and you can see those fortifications there. You can see those there. fortifications. It's, but it's very, for, to, for a lot of your viewers, the, the cathedral is quite interesting. It's not the most interesting church in there, but it is quite interesting. Because in the... In the vaults of the cathedral, which you can visit, which have been recently renovated, which are very nice, I, you can see the skull of St. Valentine. The actual St. Valentine? They believe this is the skull of... Oh, now, was he the guy with the St. Valentine's massacre? No, that was... You, you've been watching Some Like It Hot. That was Tony Curtis and Jack Lemmon in the film. Uh, no, this was St. Valentine. What? The, the You're one, confusing me now. This is the... the Saint oh, whose you mean feast uh, we celebrate on the 14th of February. This is the original guy with Valentine's. This is the original Saint Valentine. Saint yeah. Valentine. It's really his skull. They believe it is his How skull. How do they know? I don't know. In, in the Middle Ages, people went around collecting these sort of relics. They would it. keep them because there they wasn't much them, else yes, to do. Let's face fair, it. Yeah, but uh, it's actually they very, didn't have Game Boys. It's a very interesting, um, very interesting t trip there. They got all sorts of things down in the in the vaults, which have recently been yeah. renovated. So they're very nice to see. Oh, that sounds interesting. Good lighting yeah. and some interest. And you can see yeah. even some of the very early foundations of the church, because the current. How old is that skull, by the way? Do you remember? I don't remember exactly. Vaguely? No. Any idea? No. I Not have no very idea. old. And, and Would you say it's 500, 600, oh, 700 more than years? That. More than that. I didn't know that he was hanging around in Poland. That's well, nor bizarre. did I. But of course, who knows? May, some traveler may have brought his skull. You know, you never know. You People never would, know. The monks but, but would they, travel they, about we, with when things. We, when we were yeah. be, being shown around, they, mm. they were very proud of this particular relic. Uh, it's also Shemisel is a very good place to do to go to. Lvov. Now I know Lvov is not in Poland, but it used to be. It used to be in Poland, yes. And it's it's known as a as a, a largely Polish city. Even today, they speak Polish there, and Pol, uh, if you speak a bit of Polish and you go there, people are very receptive. Yes, of course. And it's a beautiful town. It was not really destroyed. No. Uh, it's a bit dilapidated, but that, I think that adds to the charm. Yeah, I've heard it. I've not been, but yeah. I've heard it is, it is lovely architecture, which can yeah. do with a lick of paint and a bit of yeah. touching up here and there. That's right. And you can get there just by going through the border um, near... Near Shemisel, and you can—I can tell you—you you can walk right through the border. You can leave your car at the border. You don't have to wait in line because it can take a while. And the roads are not great in the Ukraine. Let's face it. No. You, know, you have to stay on the main roads. Yeah. They're not great, not yet. Um, and you can get a ride into town since this is a travel show. If anybody wants to go, look, okay. you can get a ride into your tip, in, is it? from from the border on the other side. It's very fast, actually. You go through. Um, they check the passports. And uh, you get on the other side, and there are people waiting, and they'll take you into town for 100 zlotys. And then That's very good. Tell them, they'll take you right to your hotel, you tell them when you're leaving, and they'll come back and get you. That's excellent. When you're leaving, and bring you back for another 100 zlotys. So, well, and that's 100 zlotys per car. you're not worried about where to park your car or anything like that? What? 
You're not worried then about taking your car into yet another country? So well, no. Yeah, well, uh, it's just the waiting that's the yeah, problem that's mainly, isn't it? It's a good yeah. top tip there. To yeah, yeah. Save time. Yeah. So, and you can go over and see. So, Shemisul's nice. Shem, Shemisul is, Shemisul is a nice sound, town. And uh, you can get to Lvov. And you can see a bit of the old school Polish uh, architecture and a city which is now in the Ukraine, of course, called Lviv. In Ukraine, uh, yes. In Ukraine. Uh, but has a lot of Polish... A lot of Polish uh, history. ...history to, to, be, to be looked at. I mean, you and it's I... It's very good food, too. Yeah, I mean, you and right. I probably tend to... Because I, I come from an island, you come from a country which might as well be an island a long way from... We, we, you know, we're, we're used to sort of fixed borders. And a lot of these, these towns and, and cities in this part of the world, they, they, they've moved, the borders have sort of moved around them mm -hmm. quite a lot through history. Which yeah, of, Belarus, a lot of this, exactly and so, also so that Vilnius It's, it's used always to quite be. fascinating seeing the different influences on these uh, places. Polish, yeah. Because it's not something you and I in our countries have ever sort of have encountered that Well, much. no, I mean, in, you know... Uh, uh, if at all. England hasn't been invaded since 1066, and well, well, the other South successful. hasn't been invaded since 1865. I mean, occasionally, the, occasionally, the French would try and land an army in Ireland. Did you hear what something. I said? Yes. The South hasn't been invaded since 1865. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. What, <laughs> that was in the, the last war, occupation. You'll be telling me now about the war of northern aggression. <laughs> I am, I am. But that's a different story. Yes, that's, that's a different story. That's not really story. travel in Poland, is it? Yeah. Uh, okay, so we. I added a couple of things. I think that area is really nice, and you can also get down from... Shemisul, once you're way down there, you're close to the Biaschady, you're close to Ukraine and to Lvov, and it's a great area. Yeah, it is, and then the countryside just north of You will uh, not Shemisul. be disappointed it, it, if you, if you venture there. That's the things point. Things to see there as well. Yeah, it's one of my favorite it, it's very, areas it, in the it, country. Well, yeah, yeah. It's a bit of an area which people tend to overlook, but yeah. definitely worth a visit. The Biaschady is beautiful as yes, well. Yes, exactly. And, 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 and wild. You and might, and you the, might and see and a the, bison. Yeah, and, and the Schwentzakschiska hills and so on are very, very attractive. Scenery. Uh, Schwinsk, yeah. yeah, it's just just, just to the yeah. a bit north. But exactly. That's, that's right. a whole other subject. That's what I said. But we're running out of time. We're always running out of time. Just when things get interesting, we're I, running out I of know, time. I know that's the problem with. Can't the, you speak to the producer and see if you can get uh, a bit more time? The problem with television, you know, it's just, right. there's just never enough time. Never enough time. But uh, you come back and we'll talk yeah, at length. Yeah, of course. Schwinsk is a great place. I want to go there with a travel show and do the the castles. Yeah, that would know, be very interesting. Between Krakow and Czestochowa. That is an amazing area. I completely agree. One of my favorite areas as well. I tend to like the eastern parts of Poland. Yes, I don't well, know why. I think Poland is a country yeah. where, actually, in fact, a lot of say, the, a lot of the the interesting or the more interesting areas tend to be around the edges. You've yeah. got the mountains in the south and, and then down to Shemyshul. And then the sea. In the north, you've got the sea and the That's coastline. A good point. I then in the east, that. you've got the forest. Yeah. And the west. What? And the west is, you know, you've got some, you've got that the, 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 the Poznan Odra, and Wrocław, well, those sort of big, yeah. those sort of big sort of which were part of Germany once upon a time. Poznan, and then in the middle Szczecin, where Warsaw is, you Wrocław. tend to have an area yeah. which is geographically less interesting because it's a sort of big sandy plain. Mm. And then you've got Warsaw in this big sandy plain, but it, you don't have quite the geographic. It interest. is a sandy plain, and you know why? Because the Wisła twenty thousand years ago was about twenty kilometers wide, yeah, or exactly, something. Exactly. Yeah. Vastly wide, yeah. yeah. At any rate, thanks for being here. Thank you, my good pleasure. You. It's always good to see you. Nick. Always good to be I here. I always enjoy talking with you. Thank you. Always interesting. It is. Always a lot Great of fun. Great fun. Thanks for coming by. My pleasure. Thank you okay. for inviting me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's it for this, uh, for this episode of Poland Daily Travel on There's a Will. I'm Will, and we really thank you for watching this program. If you like what you saw, go down and give us a like on the YouTube there, it really, really helps a lot to, uh, to uh, get our uh, program around to other people. And you can share it too if you really like it. Okay, that's it from me and Nick, and we'll see you next time.